Hello everybody, welcome to Retro Game Super Leagues. I'm Brian, also known as UKGN Zoidberg. These Super League videos are made in conjunction with the Amiga re-review every two weeks. And the game that we featured on last week's episode was Shadow of the Beast 3 from Cygnosis and Reflections. If you've not seen that one yet, make sure you go back and watch it. Today, I'm going to be seeing how that game compares to other platform adventure games on the Amiga. So stick with me as we see which ones are the cream of the crop and which are the ones that you should be avoiding. In total, there are 31 games that I'm going to be ranking today. There will be games that I've missed, but I can only fairly rank the ones that I have actually played. And as always, I'm going to be ranking them in one of the five categories that you can see before you. Uh, rubbish, poor, good, recommended or essential. So we kick things off in this list with Arabian Nights, which came out in 1992 from Chrysalis. Uh, it's actually made by the same team that made Soccer Kid and came out just a few months after that one. So therefore, this one got completely overshadowed. Although, as far as I'm concerned, this one's actually the better game of the two. Um, it's fast, smooth, accompanied by a really good piece of music. You could definitely argue that the puzzles in it are probably a little bit on the basic side for some experienced gamers. But that doesn't stop the game from being enjoyable and an easy one to recommend. So that's where it's going to go. Next game is Black Lamp, which came out in 1988 from Firebird. It's an absolutely abysmal adventure game um, that sees you playing a court jester searching a kingdom for seven magical lamps. It's got some truly appalling controls. Something as simple as climbing a ladder is a lot harder than it should be. And you're constantly bombarded by enemies, which means that you don't get a moment to try and work things out. At least the Commodore 64 and Atari ST versions had a nice version of green sleeves uh, in the background accompanying the action. But here, there's just a constant noise that's supposed to be sound effect. There is nowhere that this can go other than the rubbish section. Next up, we have Blinky's Scary School, which came out in 1990 from Zeppelin Games. It's a shameless ripoff of the Dizzy Games, really, uh, but it lacks all of the charm and appeal that makes those games such a success. Uh, the graphics themselves are perfectly fine. But uh, unfortunately, the screens that you explore are incredibly samey, which makes it very, very easy to get lost. It also features a lot of cheap deaths uh, with traps that you have no way of anticipating and spike pits that you can only avoid through guesswork. Basically, it's no fun to play whatsoever. So this one is also going in the rubbish category, but it's definitely better than Black Lamp. Next up, we have Cedric and the Lost Scepter, which came out in 1996 from a developer called Alcatraz. It's a good looking but strangely empty game from a team of ex-demo coders based in Germany. And it's definitely inspired by the Shadow of the Beast series, featuring a huge map to explore and having some really enjoyable platforming sections. I could have done with a little more guidance uh, for the player, especially in the early sections, um, as I did find myself uh, aimlessly wandering around the level trying to work out where I was supposed to be going and what I was supposed to be doing. Um, but uh, it doesn't stop it from being enjoyable and at least the developers have included level codes in this one so uh, this one is going to go in the good category next up we have Crystal Kingdom Dizzy which came out in 1993 from Codemasters and that's a name that you're going to be hearing quite a lot in this Super League um, and this is the first of many games in the Dizzy series that we're going to be covering um, what makes this one different from the rest is that uh, all of the action is broken up into smaller self-contained levels and that's something that didn't really work for me. Um, graphics are nice enough I suppose and there's a catchy tune playing throughout as you play just like all the other games in the series. Um, you know what you're going to get with a Dizzy game. This one is still fun but it's not the best one and it's not the worst um, so I'm also going to put this one also in the good section. Uh, just above Cedric. Next game on the list is Deliverance from 1992, uh, published by 21st Century Entertainment and developed by a team called Devin. No amount of great graphics can disguise the fact that there isn't a very good game underneath it all. The graphics are huge and well animated, but unfortunately that means that you only get to see a few steps ahead of you and you constantly get attacked by enemies that you can't see. The whole thing is incredibly frustrating to play because the platforming itself is awkward. It's all rather pointless because it's incredibly similar to another game that's going to be coming up later on. 
and I can't recommend it at all. I'm going to stick this one in the poor category. Next up, we have Dizzy Prince of the Yoke Folk from 1992, also developed by Codemasters themselves. And if you only play one Dizzy game, this is the one to play. Uh, the graphics are excellent. It starts with a quick tutorial as to how, the thing, how things work for newcomers as well. Uh, and you can't help but smile as you're playing it. It's a shame that there's no sound effects, but at least the music is good. And like all the game, like all the Dizzy games, it's always always annoying that you have to start from the beginning after you lose all three of your lives. But like I said before, this is the best one of the series, so this is going to be the only Dizzy game that goes in the recommended section. Next up, we have Elf from 1991, developed by Nirvana Systems and published by Ocean. Um, this is a game that hasn't aged particularly well, thanks to some problematic racial stereotypes, and that's a shame because everything else about it is pretty good. Uh, basically, it tries to do all of the same things that Black Lamp did, but it does them in an enjoyable way. Once again, this is a game that makes you choose between music or sound effects, but both of them are above average. One of the things that holds it back is the fact that uh, there's a lot of backtracking required when, you, when it comes to solving the puzzles. But um, that makes it more frustrating than it should be, and that means that it's only going to go in the good category, but I'm going to place it just below Cedric. Next up, we have Fantastic Dizzy, which was the last Dizzy game released on the Amiga. And this is the Dizzy game that actually scrolls. Yes, rather than flick screen, this one actually moves smoothly left and right. And there's even a day-night cycle that changes, the, that changes the lighting. However, this is all in the service of a game that feels like a series that was treading water. It's not one that I would ever choose to play, and once again, the lack of a save game option hurts it. So this can go nowhere else other than the good category but it's going to go at the bottom so that's going to go below elf next up we have fantasy world dizzy which came out in 1991 and was developed by optimus or codemasters this was released at a time when codemasters were still trying to crack the 16-bit market and it kind of shows it's definitely one of the lower quality games in the series um but it does have a really good piece of music uh, by alistair brimble the graphics, though, are frankly a bit of a mess. It's got a lot of cheap deaths, and the inventory system is a bit of a pain to use. It's still got that dizzy charm, of course. There are better games in the series to play rather than this one, so I'm going to stick this one in the poor category, just below Deliverance, unfortunately. Next up, we have The First Samurai from 1991, developed by Vivid Image. This is a game that I have previously covered on the re-review. And it's an absolutely fantastic combination of platforming, fighting and puzzling. That's also much better than any of the console versions that followed it. Um, both the graphics and sound are thoroughly excellent. And they're matched by gameplay that's both enjoyable and challenging. The only grumble is that the boss fights are a little bit on the simple side. But they aren't enough to stop this from being a game that you must play. And this is going to be the first game that goes into the essential category. Next up, we have Flashback from 1992, developed by Delphine and published by US Gold. Put simply, this is the best game on the Amiga as far as I'm concerned, and it's one that I have bought and rebought multiple times over the years, um, including most recently on the Evercade. Um, it's a gripping sci-fi story that take, borrows elements from the likes of Total Recall and The Running Man, and it's got graphics that absolutely ooze atmosphere. As for the gameplay itself, it's challenging when it needs to be, and it's always fun. If you've never played this game, then you should absolutely change that immediately. This is going to go right at the top of the Essential category. Next up, we have Gods from 1991, developed by the Bitmap Brothers, and published by Renegade. And this is another Stone Cold classic, and... And as far as I'm concerned, this is the best game that the Bitmap Brothers ever made, which I know is going to be a bit of a contentious statement. The four levels that are included are all packed with enough enemies, secrets and puzzles to, to keep you coming back time and time again. I'd happily sit and play this game for hours over pretty much anything that's released today. And on top of this, the graphics are incredible and the sound is gloriously epic. Once again, just like the first Samurai, the console versions are vastly inferior to this Amiga version. And this is going to go in the essential category between First Samurai and Flashback. 
Next game is Leander from 1991, developed by Traveller's Tales and published by Psygnosis. This is the game that announced Traveller's Tales onto the world, um, and they're a team, if you don't know, who have gone on to much greater things with their platform games based on various Disney games, as well as their many, many LEGO titles. It's a slick, good-looking adventure game with a great use of colour to display the player's remaining health through the colour of their armour. Exploring and jumping around the levels is a lot of fun, especially as it's a game that supports a two-button joystick. The only thing that um, is slightly annoying is that, that it suffers from some unfair difficulty spikes from time to time. However, this is still going to go in the good section, and I'm going to put it just underneath Prince of the Oak Folk. Next up, we have Little Puff in Dragonland, released in 1989, from published by Codemasters and developed by Consult Software. Whenever Codemasters hit upon a winning formula, formula you could always guarantee that they were going to rinse it to death. And this is yet another game in the Dizzy Mole, but this time you control a cute green dragon. However, Spyro, this is not, as this, as this game is not good at all. The primary issue is that the collision detection is absolutely appalling, and you'll die often when it looks like you should be safe. And how many lives did the developers deem were enough for you to complete the entire game? One. So um, nowhere else this can go other than the rubbish category, I'm afraid. So uh, I'm going to put it underneath uh, Blinky's Scary School. Next up, we have Magic Land Dizzy from 1991, uh, developed and published by Codemasters. And for many years, this was my favourite of all the Dizzy games. It's got one of the best worlds to explore, the music is easily the best in the series, and it looks great. Some of the writing is even laugh out loud funny too. As always, it's the platforming side of things that offers the greatest challenge that the player will come up against. Uh, and there are too many instances in this one where you can fall you can fall all the way back down to the bottom and it will take you ages to get back to where you were. And that is always frustrating. So for me, this is gonna go in still gonna go in the good category. And it's better than Crystal King Dizzy, so I'm putting it above that one. Next up, we have Myth History in the Making from 1992, developed by System 3. And I absolutely cannot fault the visuals in this flawed but somewhat enjoyable journey through the world of myths and legends. What lets down the gameplay side of things is the overly fiddly controls, with selecting weapons in particular being annoying, and the somewhat slow movement. Fortunately, it's a game that feels incredibly rewarding when you actually work out what you're supposed to be doing on each level. I remember the review scores at the time being incredibly high, particularly in Amiga Action, but I always felt that it was a game that didn't quite reach its full potential. So for me, this is still going to go in the good category. Uh, I'm going to put it between Cedric and Elf. Next up, we have Odyssey, released in 1995 from Audiogenic the makers of Exile, and there's probably a really great game hidden away in Odyssey, but just like Exile, the manual is no help whatsoever in finding it. The game offers up a selection of islands for you to jump around and explore, and there's definitely a certain amount of enjoyment to be had from doing so. But because I was never really sure of what I was supposed to actually be doing, that enjoyment faded away quite quickly. It's a shame, as it looks like a game that I would have liked to play more of, um, I'm going to stick this one in the good category and I'm going to put it between Cedric and me. Next up is a game that you may well have heard of called Prince of Persia, released in 1990. Uh, the Amiga version was converted by Brodebund and it was published by Domark. The Amiga version was actually my first experience of Prince of Persia, so for that reason it kind of gives it the edge in the nostalgia even if there are other versions of the game that are slightly better. Playing it with a joystick does make it slightly more tricky than it should be, um, especially the sword fighting, but that doesn't stop it from still being a great game. Even all these years later, the rotoscoped animation is a joy to behold, so I'm going to stick this one in the essential category, and I'm going to put it above the first Samurai. Next up, we have Second Samurai, which came out in 1994 from Vivid Image. Um, once again, this time published by Psygnosis. And this is a crushingly disappointing sequel that does many of the same things that the first game did, but adds in a lot of other things that lessen the experience. Chief among these is a completely unnecessary two-player mode that nobody wanted or asked for, but also the levels themselves are smaller and less interesting. 
it's still a game that's worth playing, that's for sure. But um, when you look at how good the original was, I was expecting so much more from a sequel. I'm going to put this one down in the good category. And I'm going to put it below Magic Land Dizzy. Next up, we have The Seven Gates of Jambala from 1989, uh, published by Thallion. And there's definitely something appealing by this early game from the German developer, especially the music. Um, but it's all undone some, by some incredibly awkward platforming. The height and distance of your jumps is something that is dictated to you by your momentum. And that's something that, in my experience, has never made any platforming game fun. If you stick with it, then there are a lot of secrets to discover and you will meet some interesting characters on the journey. But getting there is a slog. And there's nowhere else I can put this one other than the poor category, I'm afraid. And I'm going to put it below Fantasy World Dizzy. Next up, we have Seymour Goes to Hollywood, released in 1992 from developer Optimus and published by, yes, Codemasters again. With yet another game that involves collecting items and using them in the right location. Um, no idea what kind of creature Seymour is supposed to be, uh, but the game that he stars in is actually pretty entertaining. It looks nice and it has another great score from Alistair Brimble. Perhaps a little bit too easy to get lost in the maze of Hollywood Studios, but that's probably the point. And none of the puzzles that are included in it are going to give you a headache. Um, but the moment you stop playing it, you'll have forgotten about, forgotten about it completely. Um, I'm going to put this one just below Fantasy World Dizzy as well. Next up, we have Shadow of the Beast 2 from 1990, developed by Reflections and published by Psygnosis. Uh, the reason why you won't see the first Shadow of the Beast game here is because I wouldn't really call that one a platform. Um, but the sequel was a big leap forward from the series in terms of gameplay. It's also, sadly, way too tough, especially in the early stages. And you only get one life, and there's a far too many random enemy attacks that are impossible to avoid. If you do manage to get through those early stages though, or God forbid use a cheat code, then you will get some enjoyment out of it. Special mention should go to the excellent guitar solo on the game over screen though. Um, I'm going to stick this one in the good category and I'm going to put it underneath Elf. Next up we have Shadow of the Beast 3, which was the game that we covered on the re-review last week. Uh, released in 1992, also developed by Reflections and published by Psygnosis easily the best game in the beast trilogy even if it's also the worst one from a visual standpoint by splitting the game up into levels there's a much greater focus and allowing the player to tackle those levels in any order that you see fit was definitely a good idea the puzzles themselves are generally fun to solve but unfortunately the fact that um you can fail completely which forces you to use up one of your lives wasn't the wisest design decision in the world the music is once again fabulous though um, this is going to go, I think I'm going to put this one in the recommended category, but it's going to go below Leander. Next up, we have Slightly Magic from 1991, which uh, is once again published by Codemasters, but this one time from a developer called Astonishing Animations. It's another budget title from Codemasters that follows the Dizzy formula. It's, it's, it's extremely basic and clearly aimed at kids with some... Um, very simple puzzles to solve. Apart from the nice intro, intro and title screens, the graphics themselves are not great. But the worst thing about it is the actual platforming, where it's far too easy to miss your jumps entirely. And it doesn't even recognise what direction you were travelling when you flick from one screen to the next. To be honest, it's probably a game that was better suited to the spectrum. So this one is going to go below Seymour Goes to Hollywood. Next up, we have Spellbound Dizzy, also from 1992, and this one is once again from developer Optimus. This one is one of the biggest games in the Dizzy series, which the game proudly tells you when you read a scroll on the opening screen. But with that size comes a game that is empty and dull, and in the case of the Amiga version, also a little bit broken. The series was starting to show its age at this point, and the limited inventory space was really becoming a problem. Especially in the early stages of this one, where you have to transport some rocks from one, one part of the level to the next. And there's a lot of toing and throwing, which got really annoying. It's a shame, really, as it does actually as it does actually play better than some of the other games in the series. But um, I'm going to put this one just above Fantastic Dizzy in the good category. 
Next up, we have a game called Terramex from 1987, developed by Tech Software. And as we all know, the thing about cross-platform titles is that they feel a, bit, a little bit out of place on the more powerful systems. So uh, this was clearly a game that was designed for Commodore 64 and Spectrum. And then they all they did for the Amiga version was add a little bit of extra polish. But it's not very good at all. I also can't see this game being released today without at least a, some accusations of cultural insensitivity in terms of the different nationalities that you can play as and the use of natives to carry your equipment. Uh, probably best leave this one in the past. I'm going to put this one right down in the rubbish category. Um, and it's not quite as bad as Black Lamp. Next up is Titanic Blinky from 1991, also from Zeppelin Games again. Second entry for Blinky. And for the second game in the Blinky series, um, Zeppelin changed things up a little. Uh, gone were all the cheap deaths of the original. And in its place, they've given the central character a gun for some reason, which I found completely out of place. The puzzles no longer involve collecting items and carting them around the level. And instead, this one opens up with you collecting musical notes to access the interior of the ship. The graphics are nice, just like the first game, and the map is a lot smaller this time. It's still ultimately a bad game, just not as bad as the first one. So uh, I'm going to put this one below Slightly Magic. Next we have Traps and Treasures, which came out in 1993 from Starbite Software. I somehow managed to miss this one when it was released in 1993 despite it getting some good reviews in magazines. But when I did finally play it a couple of years later, I found a charming and challenging platform game. Jumping around the various islands and working out how to rescue your crew members is actually great fun, with tight platforming controls, and it even eases you in with a few smaller levels before it expands out properly. This one's going to go in the recommended category, and I'm going to put this one above Shadow of the Beast 3. Next up, we have Treasure Island Dizzy, which is the which was the second game in the Dizzy series. And you can tell that Codemasters were still trying to work out the kinks at this point. Uh, whoever thought that it was a good idea to give the player a single life in a game full of hidden traps needs their head testing. There's nowhere near the amount of puzzles that you would normally get in a Dizzy game. And the music is really, really annoying. Um, this one's going to go in the poor category. And I'm going to put this one above Titanic Blinky. And for the final game, we have Wonder Boy in Monsterland, released in 1989 from developer Images. And this is a game that we have featured on the Super Leagues before when I did the Sega games. And frankly, this is not what I think of when I think of Wonder Boy. Um, I think of the excellent arcade original and not these slow moving, tedious adventure games, even though there are actually more games like this in the Wonder Boy series. Even so, this Amiga conversion is actually far worse than any of the others. And if you absolutely have to play it, then play the Master System or Mega Drive versions instead. This one's ugly, has jerky scrolling, and it controls badly. So I'm going to stick this one in the poor section, just above Seven Gates of Jambala. So there you have it. There's 31 platform adventure games ranked. I hope you've enjoyed me going through them all. If there are any games that you think I've missed, then please do let me know in the comments. And make sure you come back next week to see what, what next week's re-review is going to be all about. Um, thank you for watching this one. Until next time, happy retro gaming, and I'll see you soon.